University Miami Beach Urban Studios. Thank you for joining us today for Contemporary, a conversation with multidisciplinary artist Juana Valdez and Miami-based independent curator Danielle Damas, presented by Miami Beach Urban Studios, Casa Cuba, and the Frost Art Museum. Miami Beach Urban Studios is an incubator for communication, architecture, and the arts, and a collider for people, technology, and design. We're located on Lincoln Road on Miami Beach and have four galleries and the largest 3D printing lab in Florida. We are excited to be collaborating on the series of art talks with Casa Cuba. I believe this is our sixth talk that we, uh, we have highlighted art in Miami. Casa Cuba is bringing together scholars, artists, policymakers, business leaders, students, and the community at large to build a leading cultural center and think tank for the discussion and study of Cuban affairs and the preservation and celebration of the Cuban heritage. Casa Cuba has attracted influential board members, secured a prominent site on the FIU campus for a state-of-the-art facility, and received a significant philanthropic support, including prestigious grants from the National Endowment for Humanities and the Knight Foundation. The facility will feature galleries for interactive exhibitions, classrooms where faculty will teach more than 70 courses on Cuba, currently offered at FIU, and a venue for events, artistic performances, and dynamic programming, such as this contemporary series. Now I'm excited to introduce Danielle Damas, who will be in conversation with Juana Valdez. Danielle Damas is a Miami-based curator, cultural producer, creative consultant, and fine arts writer. She's a graduate of the MFA Curatorial Practice Program at Florida International University. She's curated numerous exhibitions throughout South Florida, including Miami Beach Urban Studios, the David Castillo Gallery, the Bakehouse Art Complex, and Art Basel. Her curatorial writings have been featured in the Miami Rail, in Specio, and Lux Interiors and Design Magazine. Hi, Danielle. Thank you for joining us and inviting Juana Valdez to be part of the Contemporary Art Talk series. I look forward to your conversation tonight. Thank you, Colette, for your kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be presenting our sixth speaker of Contemporary tonight, Juana Valdez. Juana uh, uses printmaking, photography, sculpture, ceramics, and site-specific installations in her practice to explore issues of race, transnationalism, gender, labor, and class. Functioning as an archive, Valdez's work analyzes and decodes experiences of migration as a person of Afro-Caribbean heritage. Born in Pinar de Rio, Cuba, which is also where some of my family is from, uh, Valdez came to the United States in 1971. She received her BFA in sculpture from the Parsons School of Design, her MFA from the School of Visual Arts, and attended the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. She is currently an, an associate professor in the art department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Juana's recent solo exhibitions include Rest Ashore at Locust Projects, Terrestrial Bodies at the Cuban Legacy Gallery at Miami Day College Freedom Tower, and an inherent view of the world, which was originally on view at Mindy Solomon Gallery. Um, this exhibition was later acquired in full by the Perez Art Museum, Miami, and is currently on view in their group exhibition, Polyphonic. And that will be on view until March of 2021. Her work has also been exhibited at a multitude of museums and university galleries, including El Museo del Barrio, MoMA PS1, and the Museum of Contemporary Art North Miami, among others. She has been a recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Grant, the Ali's Creator Award, the Paula Krasner Foundation Grant, just to name a few. Juana, thank you so much for joining us tonight, all the way from Massachusetts. I also invite you. Hello. To... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me, Danielle. It's really wonderful to be here. Uh, 
and, and to be in conversation. And thank you uh, to everybody else at Casa Cuba for making this happening and putting it together. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I, this is like the last in a series of conversations since the show opened, uh, the Rest of Shore show opened in Locust Project, uh, which that happens in September 12th of this year and it closed on October 24th. And so the, the show has garnished a lot of publicity and interest and it's been really excited. And I've been had the opportunity to be invited to a series of talks that uh, generated a, about the work. So I'm hoping that this is gonna be a little bit more about the show and about me being one more Cuban from Miami. <laughs> yes, it will absolutely be all about you. <laughs> this show, all about your history, whatever you feel comfortable sharing tonight. Um, Tonight, I know that you've, uh, we're, we're all in for a great experience. Juana will be sharing some Im images from her most recent exhibitions here in Miami and some from early on. Uh, just a few images to, to show her wonderful practice. And for anyone who has any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll incorporate them. Um, you know, as, as Juana presents, but tonight we're also doing something a little different. If someone wants to save their questions for the end to ask, you know, come on screen and ask Juana herself, you're more than welcome to, to do that as well. So whether you want me to ask and, you know, you wanna write it in the chat or you wanna hold off on your questions to the end and come on camera and, and say a quick hello, you're more than welcome. So Juana, you want to begin your, um, yes. screen share so we can start. For sure. Yes. Let me, okay. Give me a second. I'm done so used to Zoom that I sort of like lost it. <laughs> <laughs> I just have the Zoom every. I, I, every I'm sorry, you said? I mess up on Zoom almost every time I use it. So. <laughs> Like I, I feel there's a moment in time when I get really good at it and then I, I stop being really good at it and I forget what I'm supposed to do or how to do it and I remember things and I forget other things and uh, so I'm going to start here and I'm going to begin the presentation. Um, and so I, if, if everybody can see the work and I'm more than happy also to stop and we can talk about things that you see um, that I'm presenting. Um, I was really wanted to, for this to be very casual and, and, and to be a conversation about my experience as an artist. Um, so, I mean, I, I was born in Cuba. I came to Miami when I was uh, six years old, almost seven in November, um, actually November 11th, 1971. And um, so I have to make sure that these things don't go bad. Uh, so what you're, you're looking at actually is one of my earliest exhibitions that I did in, um, in Miami, and this was part of the Cintas Foundation. Um, hold on, I'm gonna do this because if I don't do this, it's gonna kill me all the way through. Let me get rid of, cancel, hold on. I wanna stop the, the transition so that, hold on, transition. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, let me see what it is. Uh, now I'm forgetting how to do this. So you can, anybody has suggestions? It's not transitions, it is the amount of durations. Here we go. Uh, let me, I thought I had enough time, but it doesn't. Um, okay, I, hopefully I'll take this off and it should be fine. Yeah, I think you should yeah. be good. Yeah. Oh, darn it. There you go. I know there's a 10 shortcuts to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but my mind, my mind is at a standstill today. So um, I, you know, my family comes to Miami in 1971. Um, you know, I'm about what in third grade, I think. And so we made this transition in the middle of, uh, of weeks, you know, we were in Cuba and like one day you were in Miami and for a six year old, that was sort of like a uh, it created a, 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 a sense of loss, you know, and an interruption to this other possible imaginary life that I could have had. And I think in many ways, that's probably what shaped my career as an artist. 
um, in how I come to the work. And so relatively after I finished grad school, I think I started to think about the way that I was gonna make work, um, which was really to look at my identity and try to sort of pull it apart uh, and decompartmentalize uh, aspect of it that generated the person that I, that, I, that I am today. And not specific from a sort of an aspect of, of just memory or, or, or a specific experience that just came to me, but sort of how was it possible that a person uh, from African descent and in the Caribbean and in the United States and so forth. Um, and the, the piece that I'm showing here is called Otra Vez Armal. And of course, <laughs> it, it is what it says what it is. You were once again to the sea, right? And that's sort of the relationship that Cubans have had, you know, with, with the ocean having to go back to the sea as a form of escape. And the dress is made, uh, it's actually, I purchased it at a thrift shop in Miami. Um, it's made of Arganza. It's a beautiful like 1930s dress. It's a long gown. And I beaded the dress with fish hooks and lead weights. And it, the, the skirt underneath is a fishing net that, uh, that holds the, the interior space. So you have the interior space, which can be the island and everything outside that can be the ocean in the way. And in the inside, the light sort of lit that interior space. And what you also get to hear is the sound uh, of the ocean and a conversation that is taking place um, uh, from a person uh, that you can't really decipher what the conversation is because it's overwoven by the sound of the ocean. Um, and so when I look back at this in preparation for the talk today, when I look back at this particular piece, it really brought a lot of memories of like, and, and it made a lot of connections with the most current, with the most current work that, that you see again. Um, and so Danielle has set up a couple of questions for me to answer. And one of the first ones that she had was, how did I start to work with Bone China? Which it is a very strange thing for the person from Cuba to be with Bone China, but I'm sure that if everybody here goes to their grandparents' house or family's house, they'll see ceramics, they'll see Bone China, they'll see Yadro, right? I always, I remember when I was young, everybody had uh, Yadro in the house and the ceramic. And so there's this, there are all these connections that are taking place because of Cuba and being on the island. But this particular piece is actually, is me on the Malecon in Havana. And I'm actually, putting the small little boats out to sea and the boats are made out of paper, the ripped pages from the book of Cecilia Valdez. Um, and of course, Cecilia Valdez is this famous novel, una de las novelas más famosas escrita en Cuba. Uh, the author's name is Rio Villarreal, and he wrote it back, I believe in 1839 and eventually was published again in New York in 1882. Um, and it's also, often referred to as Angel Hill. And at this time, I was actually starting to read the work of Reynaldo Arena when I started to, to read his book. And he actually also takes that novel and reinterprets it in a very contemporary way. And so I was thinking about this all dynamics. You have these two Cuban writers who have written on this particular subject and they both end up in New York as kind of uh, foreigners, you know, living the, the rest of their life. And so I made that piece in Cuba, but I really could not imagine like, in, and specifically in relationship to the boats are made out of paper, people often speak of literature as a form of escape when you don't have anything. Uh, you, you can read and read becomes a way for you to escape whatever type of situation you're in. And so for me to do this in Cuba where there's such a scarcity of everything is seemed right, but to, to come to the United States or Europe or other places and to do the same didn't really make sense. And so it wasn't until 2002 that I was doing a residency in the Netherlands and in Holland, um, which residencies is also something that I do a lot of as a way of finding accessibility to materials or a new place or desiring something else to, to sort of enter my practice. And when I was the Dutch, of course, have a history of trade also another culture that is very tied to the sea. The Dutch li live 
underwater actually and they're continuously damming and, and sorting out the water and so i was really i was interested by their relationship to the water and relationship to cubans and their relationship with the water and here this one thing that actually encapsulates them contains them and at the same way at the same time it's a source of income as well and possibilities um, and for the dutch to control trade with asia they were the first to start exporting bone china and ceramics and porcelain to the East and actually formed the first corporation that was ever established. It was called the, the East Indian Company. Um, and it's specifically just to export China and incense and um, commodities from, 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 uh, from South Asia to Europe and to sort of really did kind of develop the commodities market in Europe and bone china and porcelain at that time was one of the main things. And then being in Holland and thinking about all those things and beginning to really start thinking about my experience as a Cuban and all what all that meant, I created this series of boats. And here the boats become more, they talk about the journey, but also the possibility of return. So you have the boats that are all sort of going outwards, but some of them look like they're about to, to come back or they sort of look like they're not going necessarily in the way. And so it, it talks about in the way that the piece is installed, it talks about an exodus and this sort of narrow channel that you everybody sort of has to conform and go through, which also for me is a sort of a, a transformation, right? For you to be able to come out on the other side and, and come out to some this all sort of space that opens up and there's no longer, a, it's sort of a, a commonality, but you sort of become an individual and you're dispersed. And that was the whole idea behind the installation for the piece of all these boats, which were close to almost 200 boats. They get installed on the floor and they just sort of disappear and disperse throughout the floor uh, in the exhibition. So if, if you want to interrupt, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me and say like, what is that or what is that? Well, I was going to say like, it's, it's, um, it's interesting that you bring up that, you know, there's this also this idea of returning, returning to, to their original place, which a lot of, you know, Cubans have that wish to return to, to the island, to the, to the isolation, to the isolated island, so. Well, well, I think there comes a point in time where you, for anybody who is forced to migrate or be in exile, there is a desire to go back to so to to understand it from a different perspective, to reevaluate it again, and to see it, to just to see it one more time. That is the desire to see it because I left as a such a young child. I didn't construct my own mature understanding of what it would be or what Cuba was. Right, and so as a child, and this is for many first, second generation of Cuban Americans, we actually grew up first hating our parents continuously talking about Cuba, nonstop every day at dinner and every other place that they go. <laughs> 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 you kind of accept it. You you're like you know it's a party and they're talking about Cuba, uh, and so <laughs> it doesn't matter what's going on. They're talking about Cuba, but uh, so when you're young, you're irritated by that. But there comes a point in time when you arrive at your maturity that you need to know who you are and being able to define who you are and how you will be in the world. You need to know where you come from, right? And you need to form your own construct of that. And so that desire to return becomes a part of, of that need to be able to move forward as well. Right, and I feel like it's, um, it's almost passed on to us, like, you know, as, the, as a second generation to, I, I love how you bring up memory as a part yeah. of practice because, um, in a sense, you know, for me, I've never been to the island. I do hear the stories that are always told at every, every, every party, every night, eso no pasa en Cuba, like <laughs> all of these stories, I hear them and I make up my own memory, even though I've never experienced it, but it's part of this identity. So understanding or constructing this identity through these stories, through these memories are a big part of it. And it's, it's, in, it's beautiful that, that you have transformed those constructs into physical artworks. I, I think we as Cubans have a collective 
idea or a collective memory of what Cuba is or Cuba was, right? Which, yes, in many ways it has been passed down through the many stories that our parents have shared with us and what we heard and what we've seen. And so we, there's a sense of like, we know the island, like we know it. Um, I have to say uh, that when I, re when I went to Cuba and I did that piece, it was one of my first times in Cuba and I cannot explain for someone, like I left when I was six and I think I made that trip maybe there when I was about 25 maybe or 26 or maybe a little bit older. And I remember like getting to the airport and hearing everybody like speaking Spanish in a familiar sound. And that it was uh, a, a, an iconography of that sound was so, it, it was like a wave that just engulfed me that made me feel like, oh, I belong here. Like this is where I belong. This is, they all sound like me. They're variations of me and it's a very egocentric of me to think about it that way. But I, I had never been in a place, like if you're, if you're a Cuban American, you're here as much as you, even within Miami, you don't, you have never experienced that momentum of being in a place where all you hear is your native tongue. There is no other tongue being spoken. And I think it's a very, it was a very sort of awakening experience for me and really made me understand what it was to be a native, you know, quote unquote, a native son in that way and, and what it meant to, to be able to know where you originate and the kind of connotations that it has. In, in a funny way, that connotations of knowing who and what I am is also what propels me to go out into the world. Um, and so I, I have kept going back to China. That, like, I made the, the porcelain boat, I think in 2000, um, and I didn't make any more works like that. I, I was really focusing on doing other things and I, I tend to do a lot of site-specific installations and projects like, like that. And I was back so this work actually happens uh, in 2010. I, I moved back to Miami uh, to, to work at Florida Atlantic University to be a, an, a, an assistant professor there. Um, and I had the opportunity to apply for a grant to go do research. And I was again trying to do, I was thinking of working in clay to do some sculptures that didn't really work out. And I go there and back to the same residency. And I started to work on this piece. And for me, I, by that time, I was like thinking about Bone China. I started to read about the history, its importance, its importance as a material. And one of the main reasons why it's so highly praised is because it's so white. It's really like most of the other clay because of the irons or the natural materials in it tend to have some sort of color. But Bone China, which of course I used to say it was because they added bone to it, which is not true. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a kyolin. I don't want people to think they were like, you know, oh, they were killing people and getting their bones. To, uh, <laughs> it wasn't that kind of thing. But, you know, there's so many stories out there. You don't know which one are true and which ones are not. Um, but it was highly praised from uh, in, in Europe because Europe actually was not producing that type of bone china in the 16, the 15 in the 16th century. And it was having to be brought from Asia and it was really expensive and it was only for the aristocracy to be able to have. And so, but it made me realize that one of the main reasons why it was being so in demand, what is whiteness and its purity. And this idea of white and purity for me felt that I, I wanted to interrupt that discourse. Um, and being for the Caribbean, the one thing you have is color, there's, you know, this variation in color. And by this time, which you see in the beginning of the piece with the dress, my works definitely has taken on a stronger feminist sort of bent to really think about women and women's body and the value of their body uh, and how they're being appreciated either by because of their beauty or the body as a sense of labor. Um, and so this particular piece and the material for me offer the, the opportunity to bring all of these things together. Um, so it's 100% bone china. I develop a recipe for it. I, I mix pigments and I arrive of a color. The color gets embedded into the clay. And that's another thing that I, that I really have wanted to do because in a way I'm sort of altering the DNA of, of, the, of the piece, you know? 
um, because these colors don't really, like you couldn't go to a ceramic shop and buy these colors, they don't exist. I actually fabricated the color. And in that way, the, each color is an original color. Um, and it feels for me in a way like this idea of creation um, by altering the DNA of the clay, which is what happens, you know, in the body, you're able to change the, the physicality of the body and therefore the color of the clay. And I made them in all these variation of skin tones, some that are real and some that are imaginary. Um, and the size of them are determined by the shape of the fabric that I use. I'm sorry. Um, and the fabric is actually the same size as the cleaning rag. I think, and this is, I where this inspiration sometimes come from, it's hard to tell, but I remember a song, which was a very famous song, and I think, I won't know it, but my mother's generation does. And there's a song in Spanish, it says, la, usó como un trapo la botó como un trapo viejo. <gasps> and that to me was like, every time I hear that, my skin crawls. I'm like, oh, but, but it talks about the dynamics and the relationship between men and women, right? Mm -hmm. And the woman becomes this object that can be discarded and thrown away when they're no longer beautiful or desirable. But yet at the same time, women through manual labor as simply as cleaning have supported families and put kids to school. And, you know, they go home, they clean, they cook, they do all these things to, to, to sustain the, the family. And so it's a body that also produces and maintains and sustains and support as well. Um, and sort of the, the contradiction and the necessities in both uh, that are apparent. And some of the pieces are really brand new and they're, they're really kind of fresh and I would, would consider young. And some of the others are a little bit more worn and torn and you can see the degradation of the skin and making these comparison to, to, the, to the pieces. Um, right, there's such a special dichotomy between, you know, this precious bone china that's being represented as a, as a dish rag. And um, where it, it also seems very labor intensive to change the DNA of the, <laughs> <laughs> of, of the China. So yeah. that's, does, does it take a long time to like, to, to make this color or to- Oh my God, yes, yes, it does. I should, have, I should have brought in the picture of what that looks like because it's like, I'm in front of, uh, I'm, I'm in front, I'm looking at the series of images that I've done before, which sort of work with skin tone as well. And so I have that. And then I have like every recipe, every color that you can possibly write. And it's actually very scientific because it's like three zero point one of this pigment and 1.2 of that other pigment. And so it's, it's really not artistic in the way that people would think about it being artistic. It's really more about almost being like a chemist. Right. <laughs> and and bringing, I'm sorry? And very purposeful. Yes, yes. Um, so it's a way of painting without painting, I guess. Yeah, one of the things I kind of like to do uh, to paint without painting. Um, but, and then each one is shaped individually. So no two are necessarily the same. It's only the color that repeats, but the, that also brings out about the individuality of, of the person. In, in the shape of the fabric. And for me, they become quite soft and sort of beautiful. And uh, it's, it's a bit of very kind of romantic in terms of the way the drapery is done in the Renaissance painting. So, I mean, it, it also brings a lot of my formal training into the, the process. I just try to sort of keep it in the background as much as possible and sort of have all these other uh, social, sort of social political uh, things uh, ideas that are important for me to, to sort of surface through the background. And I think that's partially what I've learned to do now at a way that I feel really comfortable with it is that I'm able to make objects that apparently look quite beautiful, but then they are embedded with a very sort of compelling message. And, and I think if you're able to do that, you're able to, uh, to reach a lot more people because they're not necessarily sort of pushing away from the work. Um, so I, I was making the bone china, which I need all these insane special facilities to work with. Um, and I, I'm back again in the US, I'm here in Miami. These pieces started in about 2014. 
And so I'm now thinking about the material and where has it been made and what's my connection and where do we see it? And I realized that a place, a place that it inhabits is the home, right? And especially through women who purchase China when they get married, decorations for the home. And that made me realize one more thing, which is um, like when you're born, your first five, six years of life is predominantly within the home. That's all you see. You're not really out there in, in the world. And believe it or not, everybody's quite aware that children from the age, of, I think, for one to seven, all they are are just sponges. They're consuming all this information that is coming to them and they see. And for me, I thought, wow, then, then, what, then what your surrounding has has to also be influencing you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you're in these houses, in this environment where these kind of objects are, are dominant, you, this also has to be shaping your aesthetic value and your aesthetic taste. And that's when I started to think about how these objects really also represent a particular perspective and a particular a style and an and aesthetic and that it is predominantly a European sort of centric aesthetics. I'm sorry, let me come back. Um, in terms of the objects and the way that they made and what you see is this sort of transition of objects that are being made in Asia and East Asia and sort of it's coming into Europe and how that influence of the European aesthetics also begins to shape this object. And there's some, uh, some of these items that are actually made in Ireland or in Italy and you couldn't really tell them apart from the ones that are done in, in China or in Japan. And the, the projects begins to form in this shape of these oversized structures. It could have been a table but for me, they also begin to function almost as a vessel and as a ship that move these objects across the world. And this piece that you, you're seeing is the inherent view of the world. And it's, uh, it's, this is when it was presented at PAM. And the, the, what it does is that it kind of holds the world and, uh, uh, at eye level for you. And you're seeing all these objects that represent different sort of aesthetic values and different ways of making all the way from, from Asia to, to India and even to, to, to the Americas. And now they're all placed at the same level and at the same place. And you're able to see how one culture also influenced another culture and how they, they come together uh, and impact. So I feel like I'm just talking, talking. Has questions or <laughs> you're very to interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> You're very captivating, but I do have a couple of questions. Uh, okay, good. Let's <laughs> I do have a, two from the audience. Um, I'll okay. start with one. Uh, can you tell us about your mentors and how um, they've influenced you as an artist or how you found mentors as an artist? That's a really in interesting question. So when I, I left Miami in my early 20s and I decided to go to New York to study. Um, and so I have to say, I do, I am one of those artists that also goes back to literature and to writers. Um, I, I, I go back to books uh, sooner or later to, to sort of for, for influence or, or, to, or to think about things or to change the way that I think about things. Um, but I, so I went to New York and I, I went to study there and primarily I did it because I felt like I had really had had no real strong formal background in teaching and I mean in, in art and so I wanted to really kind of get cemented in, into the history of, of art and especially the western history of art and and I chose SVA because I they had really strong women teachers so when I went to SVA there was Judy Pfaff was teaching there, who's someone I, whose work I, I respect and has also exhibited in Miami. Uh, Peter Cohen was also teaching at SVA. Ursula was writing card, was also teaching at SVA. Um, there was one more, oh, I'm forgetting, is it Jackie Winston? Not Jackie Winston? I'm not forgetting her name right now. It was also, but I, I wanted to surround myself with women sculptors. That was one of my main decisions when I chose to, to go to grad school and primarily they were really working um, and making a statement. Um, but with that said, there are things that happen to influence you that you never imagined that will do. 
And so I also went to Miami-Dade and one of my professors at Miami-Dade was Marilyn Gottlieb Roberts, who in many ways has been like, maybe not a mentor in an everyday sort of way, but really also had a, a great impact in, uh, as a professor. Uh, for me, another person there was also Juan Martinez, who was my first art history professor. <laughs> uh, and so these people brought the brought the the world of art to me in a way that was really accessible. Um, I remember being encouraged to work on the surrounded island with Cristo, and so that became one of the first sort of introduction to contemporary art for me in in Miami. And I think in a way, I wouldn't say I wouldn't have said it then as I would say it now, but I think it did, it left a, an imprint in terms of how I think about art and what art could be or how it can be made or, and how art can function in society, which I think is the most important thing. That's also a huge introduction because it's so such a different way to introduce art to society and to think yeah. so big, you know? Yeah. Well, I remember when the, when the project of the Surrounded Islands came to Miami, it was all this insane controversy and people were like, oh, I mean, now we think about Cristo and it's like natural, oh, yeah, Cristo and John Claude, of course, why not? But at the time, there was a really serious controversy in terms of if that was art or not and how would it impact the environment and all. There was just, and I thought in a way that was actually engaging because it brought communities out to engage with one another and question one another and have to interact with one another. They normally, they were not just so that everybody's queries could be answered. Right. I have one question that I definitely don't want to um, slip <laughs> from, from today's meeting, which is what are some myths you'd like to dispel on the topic of migration? As we're mm. talking about all of these, you know, all of these pieces that you incorporate into your artwork that kind of mold together, what are some, what are some myths do you? I think the most important thing is that it's not a right. Migration is a human right. I think that's the most important thing. I think that's where the work that I'm trying to do is heading. Um, we as human beings have been migrating in this planet since its origin. You know, otherwise we would all be in Africa and we're not. <laughs> 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 so as the DNA says. <laughs> uh, and so it, it's a right and we do it not sometimes for maybe because we want berries that exist on the other side of the mountain, or, or maybe because we do want uh, health or better economical prosperity for our children, or simply because we just want to be in a safer environment where we can live our lives with dignity. Uh, and I think that to put up borders and, and, and walls, it's, it's not conducive to the way that we need to exist in this planet. And so I feel that for me, migration is it, a human right and it, it should be sort of dealt in that way. Right, and, a, and as you said, a, a, an, in, wait, sorry. <laughs> you can't remove it from our history as a people. <laughs> I mean, it's the one thing you can do, like you can go any natural history show or whatever, the first thing is they're showing you, oh, they moved from here to there, and then they went over there, and they came back here, and, and some people stay. Some people decide not to go on this journey, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and others do decide to go on their journey, and that journey, it sort of alters and changes the human being. And so that's another aspect of migration, that you don't remain the same person that you would have been in that other place. That right. journey alters and changes the human being as well. And right, a part of destiny. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the other part that people need to understand, and it's not a myth, but it's an understanding, is that it also leaves trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're going as a five-year-old child on a plane to another country, you know, or on, on, on a balsa across the, the Straits of Florida, it doesn't matter how it happens, it, it leaves a uh, it leaves a trauma in, in the individual, you know, and that it, it's not that it cannot be reconciled and not that it sort of makes that person sort of damaged or in that way, but it is something that does occur and is there with the, within the individual and is shaping their view of the world in one way or another. Absolutely, and it can almost, it definitely creates generational trauma as well. Yeah. Yes.
it's, I mean, we, we know that we, we as Cubans live that and, and we see it, uh, there are many, you know, there's a sad part because there are many generations, there's a generation of Cubans are starting to, to pass away who probably never had the opportunity to, to return to the island. I mean, this is one of the things about Celia Cruz when she dies, she never returned, she was never able to go back. Yeah. You know, that was not something she was able to do before she, before she passed away. And so that's also part of that, you know, experience. I have chills because I remember that. I remember uh, that being part of the narrative. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it stays there. It stays there. Even after 40, 50 years of success and, and accomplishment and everything else that you could attribute to what would be an, an amazing life. That, that can still be a part of some of something that's missing. So, so let's go ahead. <laughs> we'll move it al- I'll move it along. <laughs> yeah, well, now I'm realizing we have a lot of, I have a lot of images to go through and maybe we don't have as much time. <laughs> we're happy to see them all. This one, um, this you did an iteration at the Freedom Tower, correct? But this is yes. not a Freedom Tower. No, so this, the, the project for the Freedom Towers actually begins, so we are now in Houston, Texas. Um, we are in Project Row House. This was a curatorial project. Uh, this is actually, this is a, cur- a curatorial project put together by uh, Ryan Dennis and William Cordova. And Project Row House is in the third ward in, in Houston, Texas, in a predominantly African-American community. And these row houses are what they used to be called shotgun houses because you can actually open the door, shoot from one door straight through the place and out the other door. <laughs> uh, uh, were part of the, the historical section of the city. They got rebuilt or remodeled and they invite artists to come and do site specific projects. And at this point in time, I, I, had, I, had, I finally had convinced my mother to let me do her DNA um, and I had sent her DNA to 23andI to be investigated. And what really, what came back is something that she had said, this oral history that sort of got validated and it's kind of sad that I needed science to validate it. But part of that migration was the fact that we weren't able to take a lot of documents and photos and stuff. And so there is, I, I don't have that visual history that some people do have of their grandparents and so forth. And my mother's father is one, 100% Chinese. And so what comes back in the DNA is that information that not only is there sort of coastal West African within the name, within the DNA, but it's also Indonesia and Vietnamese and Chinese. And so that made me realize, which is why I said that previous conversation about us migrating, there were migrations within the migration. So within the African component, you have from different sections in Africa. So it's not just one. It's not like it's always Nigeria or Congo. No, there was actually, there's mixed uh, from different parts in Africa. And there are actually within the Asian DNA, it's also mixed from different parts in Asia. Um, and this is sort of now combined in, in one human being that that is my mother. And so I wanted to, in a way, combine that with within the home. This is a home. Um, uh, and I decided that all the information would be on the walls and the walls almost become like the skin of the space. And I created this installation of, of shelves that hold all the objects that normally would be dispersed throughout the home and furniture and stuff. And now they really are set up almost for you to, to examine and review and relationship to this DNA and information that you're seeing on the wall in relationship to the years. So the way that they do this DNA uh, for anybody who's done it, they are able to assign a specific country or, na- or nationality. There has to be enough of a DNA for within the DNA strand that would constitute a whole human being. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what that amount is. A whole <laughs> human being. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't get a label. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love how when you speak about your artwork, like you talk about it, like this, beca- the walls became the skin, the dress became the body, the, 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 the bone china, the rags, they become like these, these interpretations of bodies. And yeah. so they, 
everything kind of takes on a personality or like it, it's it's very beautiful the way that you speak about your work um i mean i i think that's also part of you working a lot i think i work a lot with symbolism and, and metaphors mm -hmm. um and they allow allow themselves to sort of be embedded within the work and or at least i'm thinking about them in that way and so you know the home is the domestic sphere of a woman right and so what does it mean when the objects are not in a way sort to to adorn and to be displayed but you're looking at them as subjects to be examined right in the same way that you might find within a museum or an institution and the, the way i set it up it really is to sort of look at the history of these objects and how they could connect to different areas or different other parts of the countries or the shapes that might reference a particular culture. I mean, some pe most people, some people might, some others don't know what celadon glaze is, but it's a very specific glaze that was developed in, in Korea. And it's this beautiful sort of green glaze that adorns uh, evenly, very thought out after. And so it's in there in the very central piece. And so it really sort of has a lot what I've realized about my work is there's a lot of embedded meaning. It's like you sort of, you, you get to it and it's like an onion, you peel and you peel and you peel and it's this and it's that and it's all this other information. And what you're seeing are, are the cyanotypes, one which are maps that actually trace the, the, the distance between Africa and, and the Caribbean and those are the pieces on the floor. Um, and the cyanotypes are, uh, I think you know what they are. <laughs> they're, they're, they're made by adding uh, a chemical to, to paper that turns the one exposed to light, they turn blue. And so it, I used it in a way to create like a map, a grid map. And so this actually talks about that physical transition across the land or, or the water by, by the map. And then you have these objects that right now so what do you say? It's, I think it was 78, 70% 70 of all commerce is transported through water, it's maritime. Mm -hmm. And then out of that, that comes to 80% of all commerce that the world does. So almost probably 90% of what everybody buys got shipped to them crossing the waters, crossing these oceans. Um, and so I, I'm beginning to make these correlations between these objects and bodies and bodies being moved across ocean for labor as objects are being moved across ocean for domestic uh, and, and domestic consumption in those relationships that who makes, who makes, who works, who doesn't work, who gets to enjoy uh, the labor of others, right? And especially within the home, because it's usually women who maintain the home and everybody else gets to enjoy that home. The rest of the family gets to enjoy that home, but it's women who usually maintain uh, and, and, and clean and sustain the home. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was great to have this opportunity to, to install this project, uh, uh, this um, uh, project row house, because it gave, it allowed me to work with the environment. All of the objects that you see there, I actually bought in Houston, Texas. I bought them and sourced them in that location because this idea that it's only maybe on the East Coast or specific is not true. The, the domestic consumption of, of, of China and sort of porcelain ware is something that sort of gets brought from Europe to the Americas. And spread. It spreads, yes. Mm -hmm. All over from East to West, North to South you will find very similar objects as you move across the, the United States. Um, uh, once I did the show, I actually was invited to do the other project at, um, at, uh, Miami. at yeah, I'm a, the, the Cuban leg, I'm trying to, the Cuban, uh, Miami Day Special Collection at the Cuban Legacy Gallery. So yes. That's, <laughs> that's <a mouthful>. yes. <laughs> um, and for there, it's, and you can, I think you can see the shift between working on a site specific space to what it means to, to, to be in a very defined, sort of very pristine gallery space, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a lot more. I should have done more of this imagery and I didn't, which of course is photographed by a very famous photographer. 
Mm -hmm. Zachary Barber. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, who does amazing miracles work for artists. But um, anyway, so I, I selected this section because it's the beginning of the installation, which takes begins in 1600. Um, and sort of with the very initial strand of the DNA, which is the African hunter gatherer uh, DNA that you see there. And you see the objects sort of kind of very small, very basic, predominantly grass and wood. And slowly they, they start to integrate more, more design, more materials, uh, more uh, different sort of or sophisticated shapes. And it begins to, to span. And you see again the, the the Daciano types, which Daciano types actually document the bottom of the objects that actually track exactly where the objects are made. Oh, and yeah. it shows you like the fabric, the, the logo of the company or the brand or the mark, or and even at times the signature of the person that makes it. And I was really interested in, I decided to use the Ciano type because it really also, it mimics water in a way that nothing else could and so what you get is the feeling of these objects either as they could be floating in the water or descending into the bottom of the ocean and you you can actually when you sit there and you look at them you very much get that experience there you're almost standing at the bottom of the ocean and you're watching these objects sort of float above you it also simultaneously gives you this feeling of like these fossilized items like yeah. encrusted in the ocean floor almost. I, I, I'm, I'm always excited when I can. So as a printmaker, this is a very popular uh, medium. And so I was always been very hesitant to use it because it's so, it can be, it has been overused and it's so, and it's so recognizable when it's used. Um, and so again, for me, like the, the color, like shifting the DNA in the porcelain that is so embedded within the process of the material that you couldn't extract one from the other. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, working with the cyanotypes and photographing them and making these things appear like they were floating in the water also provided me with the same type of, uh, of sensation where you really can seem to extract one from the other and they sort of work to support one another. I have a question here um, from one of our audience members. She asked, your installations go through sev several iterations. Can you talk about how place shapes your work? And then is there a sense at the end of each installation that you think you want to expand or revise on other occasions you show the same installation? So that's really, that's a great question. Thank you. That's a really good question because um, like when you install, I, I feel that the most significant thing is your sensibility to the space. Um, so you can put the same painting in two different spaces and the environment will alter and change that painting, right? So when you do these installation pieces and you change the environment, they themselves or the way that they're sort of viewed and received also changes. So it's really, it becomes a, a challenge for the artist to make the work sustain the same kind of interpretation and the same kind of feeling. And often at times you have to give away something. I mean, I love the project in Project Row House. It was an ideal space for the work. It added, the, the site added this other information of home and the domesticity that you will not get in a gallery space. It's impossible to simulate all the reference to the home that came from that environment. Um, but I, I also knew that bringing it into the institutional space would bring it into another context, which would be that of the museum and museum rheology and thinking about works as collectibles and works as uh, sort of remnants of, of, of a particular culture and the significance of that and that it would be, begin to, the work would begin to function in a different way um, once it was brought in into the institution space. Um, and so I tried as best as I possibly can to keep the same kind of feeling, right? And then for it to allow it to function in, in this other way. And so to substitute for the windows, I brought uh, in the cyanotypes that almost also could work as, as a way to look out or, or, or to, to bring the outside in the inside 
in, in the same way that the windows did at a, a project or house. I'm really grateful because that space almost did have the same narrow long shape as the um, as Project Row House. And so in that way, the exhibition sustained a lot of the same type of architecture and sensation that it had within the space. Um, as an artist, you have to be willing to shift, to be a shift changer. <laughs> uh, and, and because it's impossible to always control the environment in which your work is exhibited. So you have to be ready to, to allow the work also to be what it wants to be within the space that it is and have the sensibility to, to make the kind of changes that you feel will help the work articulate itself better, you know, and still hold on to, to the intent and the idea behind the work. Um, I have to say, I don't label myself as a ceramicist, primarily because I didn't receive a very traditional um, sort of training with clay. I come at clay from that sort of uh, amateur professional. <laughs> Doesn't look it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, you don't know real ceramicist. <laughs> I know how to make my clay and my colors now, um, <laughs> but but I, I'm like so I have a love for printmaking. That's why I teach printmaking. I love the smell of the print shop. I can I like I love the smell of a print shop. I have to say that uh, it's the smell of beeswax and ink and oil and I don't know and I don't know paper and so those things kind of shape you and influence you and 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 uh, I don't know I don't know where I was going with that but there's the printmaking is a component um, I like working with clay as well um, but it has to be really specific I feel or actually I believe that now at this point in time in my career and making that it's really it's a conceptual idea that drives the work and the materials sort of come together. Sometime I arrive at it by finding a material. Like if I tell you one of the ways that I started to think about it, I'm gonna sort of be honest and, and out myself in this way. Like I was actually thrifting in Miami, which everybody does. I grew up thrifting in Miami. How original is that? <laughs> <laughs> everybody thrifts in Miami. Uh, and so I've always thrifted and gone to thrift shop and stuff and I was, uh, I was at a thrift shop and I saw this beautiful, what they call a moon shaped vase, which is a round flat shape with a tube at the top, which is a very is a Japanese sort of design. And I fell in love with it and I bought it and I was going to, I bought it to give it as a gift to my nephew's wife who happened to be Japanese, right? And so I bought this beautiful vase and I was like, oh, she's gonna love it. Like I'm here I am, a, a Cuban person given to a Japanese person, a Japanese gift, like, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you don't even know at times when you sort of take on those same kind of uh, stereotypes right. and you yourself are acting in that way without knowing it. Thanks God that they live out of the country. So it took me a really long time to realize that I was like, oh, wait a second, maybe this is not a real gift. And that's how also part of this work really starts for me to really think about what is made internally for internal consumption within mm -hmm. a particular culture and what is made as an export or as an object to be export into another culture. And that particular piece actually has this beautiful geisha with a course, she has this one breast exposed and it's total exoticism of this particular culture. And mm -hmm. I was just like, ah, maybe this is not the best gift to give. Maybe I'll make artwork with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm really glad that I did not, but, but, but that I was aware of how I was myself sort of creating this stereotype about another culture that I didn't know and didn't understand. But, I, but also how er, in everyday life, what we see is impacting on us a belief system of other people's ideology and aesthetics. And this is sort of discusses the coloniality of power, which is a system which comes out of colonial rule in which these ideas are embedded within institutions, within objects, and they pertain within them, right? This mm -hmm. idea of what is beautiful is white China, not China, 
that has a color, right? Uh, and so these things, even if we're not no longer colonized, it doesn't mean that those ideas and those belief systems are not sort of embedded within these things and that these things carry it over into, in, into other uh, moments and other situations in which they uh, act out as well. Absolutely. I can believe I just outed myself in that way, but <laughs> guilty. We've all, we've all been guilty of, of moments like that. I think it's important to just have that awareness. You used it, you know, to, to better understand and, and bring it into your artwork. So moving on to rest assured. Okay, so uh, there we go. Go ahead, what are you gonna say? Um, I did wanna bring up that you, you extensively used the Wolfson archives. Um, yes. It goes along with a question I have here from Maite. Um, how much research goes along with your installations? Because you could tell there's there's a lot. <laughs> um, I know you have worked with archives in the past. Could you share how objects from the archive have appeared in your work? So I know okay. they <laughs> Thank you. So I, yes, I do. I have to, uh, I have to, let's go back here a second. I have to say, actually we can stay here because what you're seeing and maybe what you'll see in a little while is from the Wilson archive, which I'm completely uh, moving image archive, which I'm completely indebted to for their support of the exhibition uh, uh, with a uh, Locust project. I could never have done this project with them. And I feel, and I know that it was central to grounding the exhibition. So what you're seeing here and what I may have for you is actually uh, a snippet of the, um, of the archives. So I think I must have looked at over 80 hours of footage of Cubans, of the Cuban experience of Cubans, uh, immigrant Cuban refugees in the United States documented through the media uh, from as early as the late 50s all the way to the late 90s. And all of this information is edited into about two hours. And so it has also stills Okay, I'm gonna stay quiet and I'm gonna let this play through really quickly. After 6 p.m., beginning a three hour remote that carried WCKT viewers through a period of prisoner emotionalism, processing, feeding, and finally their reunion with loved ones. The day in retrospect, another WCKT special, wrapped up the highlights of the day, 17 hours after it began. Through it all, WCKT built and held community interest by giving priority to one of the nation's biggest stories of the year, offering quality and quantity programming that easily surpassed the competition in content and immediacy. The timely integration of live and film coverage was made possible by the use of helicopters to transport the film to the WCKT heliport from all key points of news coverage. So let me move this a, a little further away. So this is the, um, let's see what kind of images. Yeah, so this is the, that was the African, I believe the African princess or the African violet, which is, was a ship that was actually sent to Cuba to bring Cubans uh, uh, refugees to the United States. Um, and so sort of that happened like right in the early 1960s. And so I, what's interesting, this is the first time I've ever used the moving archive. I think the collecting with the objects is another way of sort of, the collecting was sort of my introduction to the archive and using archive material. Um, so the photographs that you see actually were from the, the Miami History Museum and the Cuban Heritage Collection at the University of Miami. And so I combined the footage from the Wilson with photographs from these other institutions to really sort of capture what was the refugee experience when they first came to the United States. I divided it into decades and I, I wanted to, for the project Rest Assure, which specifically dealt with migration, I wanted for it to have a foothold within my own sort of experience or understanding of what migration is. And for me, that is sort of the history of, of the Cubans and here in America and as refugees that whether you did or not come on a boat or on a plane or on a bus or everything, you know somebody who has, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to use this material as a way of chronicling what it looks like over a long extensive period of time 
as we are now really beginning to, to deal with what's going to be another major shift in migration worldwide that started already with the people from Syria and from Afghanistan and Africa coming. And so that when you look at what happened here in Miami with this Cuban experience and the multitudes and the variations of Cubans, the different ones that come at different periods, how they integrate themselves into this community or don't integrate themselves into the community, what their beliefs are, I thought, that this would give the, the exhibition like a really clear foothold in terms of how to look at migration and how that aspect of migration, the way you perceive it, the way you come to it can shift over periods of time, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's part of our common uh, experience in Miami to, to, be a, to be, we're used to it actually. We don't even think about it very much, whether it's Cubans or Haitians or Dominicans, depending. On, on who is, or maybe for Nicaragua or Honduras, we, we're so accustomed to this that we, we're not really thinking about it. And I thought that perhaps Miami could be a good case study, you know, to look what a contemporary city could look like. So that, that was uh, the exhibition, and, and so this is actually one of the stills from the image. I want to bring you along because I can't remember if it's this one.
for anyone. These are just, go ahead. Oh, for anyone that was not able to see on a I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, this, that video was what was being projected onto the sales, correct? Yes, yeah, yeah. So the, the video, which is a short, sort of one of the sort of rough edits of what the extended video is, the video is 13 minutes long. That was just like about a three minute short edit of, of what's uh, part of the exhibition. Um, but but it's, a, it's the central component to the exhibition and, and the whole idea on the project, which is this aspect of what does a journey of migration uh, feels like, like what's the myth, right? The myth is this is something that is done very easily and without thought or hesitation. Uh, that's the myth. It's, the myth is that it's, it's challenging, it's traumatic. Uh, one imagines what it's like to be in an ocean in the water completely uh, uh, astray or without food or, you know, maybe even going under what it might feel like to for you to go under and so what all of those imagery what is all that experience must be like for a person and how absolutely desperate must a human being be to decide to take that option right and not only for themselves but also for their children they must be at a place where there really is no other uh, alternative for them uh, other than to you know to to to, to go into the sea as, as a means of escape um, and so for me, that was really the, that was the main anchoring point of the exhibition. And I, I was awarded, so the Ulai grant was awarded to produce the, the video. Um, it's my first time working in video. I'd never done it before. So it was a bit ambitious of me to decide. <laughs> Uh, to decide not only would not only was I going to work in video, it was also going to be it had it had to have aerial views and footage, and it had to have underwater and above land, and and would have this journey. So we go back to the idea of this journey from one place, from one shoreline to the other shoreline, and all the possible outcomes and and so forth of of, of what this experience of migration can be. Um, in all of this house within this sort of um, really large ins uh, installation that uses shipping pallets as a way of also bringing in the more global component of, of global trade and commodities um, and shipping and goods that are being transported and what that is also doing uh, to, to the aspect of, of migration. So the reasons why people might migrate that are also tied to scarcity of work in some places. I think we're we're almost there. This is the last since some more detailed images of the of the video. Actually, this is a limited edition that the space did uh, for for the exhibition. And this is the the back side of the of the space.
I think we're, I believe we're probably at the very end of the slide presentation. Um, yes, I think this is it. So the, 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 last two the last two images and the videos that you're seeing were the last component of the exhibition. One shares is a three monitor uh, projection of the sunset, eternal sunsets that never seem to set. And it was really meant again as a, as a metaphor for you know, all ideas of, of hope, uh, aspirations, the future, the unforeseen, uh, things that you know, are uh, not undetermined, but offer the possibility of, of hope. And then the other one is this video, which is the person that keeps returning to the shoreline to make this decision whether to go or not to go that is really kind of contemplating what to do or not to do. And so it's about a 10 minute video and you just see him return back to the shoreline over and over and over again to, to, to sort of question the idea of leaving or, or not to leave and what does that mean? You also, um, I, I bring this up from the previous um, video that um, you did with uh, Zach Revolver and, yeah. and Lopez, but you gave people the decision when they open um, into the space to either go right or to, to go left or right. So that speaks to that, that theme of choice throughout the exhibition. Yeah. I'd like to also, um, we have about 10 minutes left. So I'd like so to- good. <laughs> like, I thought I'm like, oh my God, I'm over. <laughs> this is going on forever. <laughs> People are hungry and like, there's no popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope everyone brought their popcorn. But for <laughs> anyone that might have a question that they'd like to um, turn their camera on and ask Juana a question, I invite you to raise your hand and we can, we can go in, in a certain order if anyone has a, a, a question they'd like to ask her directly. Um, I know that that it doesn't have to be important. It could be just, you know, what's my yeah. favorite color. <laughs> yeah, I also see here we got a, a question. Oh, yeah, we got a question in the chat from uh, Lillian. What year was the first scenes as dress image from? The very first, I think, I think so it, interesting. I think one of the first aeration of that probably was in the late 90s. And that was probably for the Cintas exhibition that might have been like in 2004. Okay. And then Coralina, if you'd like to, to put your- I want your... to know her. Oh. <laughs> Hola. Hola, como esta chica? <laughs> I'm, I'm like so obsessed with this show. Um, oh, thank I, you. I, I have like so many boring questions, but actually Blame. I realized that I should just ask one that's more timely in terms of okay. when I saw your your show installed versus now okay. um have you had any kind of reflections or contemplations about uh you know post-election and and kind of it, it feels like all of a sudden people care about Miami for one second <laughs> <laughs> and of course it's going to go away but I think you know um you know, your work is has deep been deeply layered and invested in in these conversations for so long, and so all of a sudden, you know, there's this attention being paid. I'm just curious if, you know, there's there's been ways that you've processed, um, you know, the vote and the transition um, in terms of the way that the media is harnessing um, the the kind of story of Cubanos in Miami and if there's something that you'd like to add or clarify or just kind of demystify for people um, since it seems that people are all of a sudden paying attention when they normally weren't. You know, oh, hold on a second, let me come out of the slide view. Um, so I think the most important thing, I think post-election, I don't think we, we saw anything different than what we have been already debating with our families at home in private. <laughs> We don't know what Thanksgiving last year was like and what this Thanksgiving might be like. Um, <laughs> and, and so in that way, it's not new, but I think what the show did for me and I think what it did for other people, um, it brought out the diversity of opinion and belief system that exists within the Cuban community. 
Um, also, it made clear the numbers in terms of what a Cuban vote can be like, even if we're not like the largest Hispanic population in, in, in the United States, uh, the Cuban vote has a lot of potential. Um, it, um, am I frozen? Oh, I think I am. No, okay. So it has it it has um, it has power. People Cubans have been able to uh, ascertain a certain amount of political power that you can really see. But it doesn't. They're not a monolithic group, and I think and Mariel is always going to be proof of that, right? The 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 diversity of Cuban people and the diversity of Cuban thought and how they might think or feel about certain action and how that can also be kind of taken and, and manipulated in one way by, by, by social media or, or the media at large. And I think for me, the show was really helpful in that, in that a lot of uh, one of the walls in the exhibition is statistics by the Pew Foundation that talks about, like the Cuban population is concentrated in Florida, the 66% of Cubans are in, are in Florida, about 5% in California, about 4% in New Jersey. So of course our vote is gonna be here. Um, um, among Cubans age 25 or older, you was born are more likely than the foreign born to have a bachelor's degree or higher education is like a 38% or 23%. So even within our own sort of group, we diverse in terms of opinion and the way we go about things. And I think that the show was able to bring that about so that the election was not as a big surprise as, as it was. I think what would the what would the election and, and moving forward and once we get past this COVID-19 pandemic that really is sort of you know creating havoc within our communities is we'll we'll see again the the need to focus on migration and the fact that that has not gone away it's still there there are people who right now are not only they're displaced somewhere but they're also dealing with COVID in a tent somewhere or where there may not even be soap or, you know, uh, areas where you can be properly wash yourself and clean yourself and all of that is still happening. None of that has gone away. Um, and so do we have to think about a future where they will be, the majority of the people might be foreign born. And what does that mean for a country like the United States, where you have citizens that actually might have roots somewhere else, a connection to somewhere else, or have a, have a previous political experience that can actually also shape the way that they vote. And I think that is really what we experienced in, in, in the election. Um, and I, I mean, I hope that, I'm glad that the show happened before I wanted the show to remind us of this other, uh, issue that is still taking place and that it hasn't gone away and that is a very it is is something that informs and impacts our decisions right now uh, as individuals i think there was one more person lillian wanted do you had a question or something lillian yeah I, hi Juana. i know you well, can open how I, are you <laughs> it's good to I'm see fine. you <laughs> um, i wanted to start by saying that um every time i see a work of yours it just moves me to the core um and it's not just because uh, I do feel like there's a lot of parallel paths, but I think your work is so poetic and accessible and yet also so deep. And, and I think what, what you mentioned about showing people something and kind of letting them decide through the beauty of the work, I think is, is, is important. So, you know, mm -hmm. kudos uh, to you and, 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 and the work that you do. Um, I, I did want to bring out that I was very happy in this last show that you had the wall of the information right. about essentially the special um, considerations that Cubans have had in relationship or you know maybe against other immigrants, even from the Caribbean. And, um, and I find that super timely, especially given the large number of Cuban immigrants that seem to be you know, overtly anti-immigration, right? um, which is, you know, mind boggling to me, right? And so, you know, in ideas of affirmative yeah. action, you know, it's, it's, you know, we don't like it when it's for someone else, but we'll take it when it's for us. And, and so I just, I mean, I, I, I think that was a very bold move doing it in Miami. And I just wanted to applaud you for it because I think that it needs to be said and reset because it's true. And I just wanted to thank you for doing that. 
you know, so it's really interesting because I so archives and working with archive and working with data, right? You don't, I, I don't alter it. Right, right. <laughs> That's the best thing I can. I won't alter it. I don't know if other people will, but I definitely won't alter. It. So for me, it wasn't like I was pointing a finger in any day. I just selected the data. The data is absolutely there, available for everybody. I just thought what I did as an artist was put it into a context, right? So you have like from the earliest, one of the earliest uh, actions that is the, the it was a million dollars, I believe that it was given to the Cuban refugee yeah. and this is happening in 1960s. That's the equivalent to almost $8 million a friend of mine was sort of did the math of what it would be like for one particular group of refugees to get mm -hmm. that kind of support, right? Um, I think I remember recently reading that the, the United States lowered the number of refugees that was taken to like to 15,000 this year. And, and, and when El Mariel happened, and again in the 1990s con los Barcero, we were getting like 30,000 Cubans in a month, I think it was, or something like that. It was, it was crazy. So when you think about those kind of numbers to what's happening now in terms of migrations, you have to think about it. But for me, I didn't, I mean, I didn't feel brave because it's not something that I, that I made up or put out there or, or made a very specific statement. It was published in, by the Sun Sentinel. It exists online. The Pew Foundation does research on all Hispanics in the United States. I just specifically, and I thought that it's, it was appropriate for me to, that was one of the decisions with when I first started to work on the project, I, I had a much bigger scope and I sort of pulled back on that and sort of, I said, I need to address the community that I come from, the people that I know, the problems that I know, the problems that I have within my own family uh, in terms of how we see and express ourselves. And so I really, that's why I pull back and only use the information based on Cuban. And so the, the data is our lives, you know, the fact that most you know, Cubans do go on to get a, a higher education, especially if they're born here in the United States. That's just what, that's our lived experience. The fact that, uh, so out of all Hispanics in the United States, Cubans own more property, yeah. right? And Cubans in Florida own more properties than Cubans anywhere else in the United States. What does that say, right? What does it mean to be, to have the strength of a community? Uh, that reaffirms itself, that, that if your neighbor owned their home, why am I not going to own their home? And suddenly you have whole neighborhoods, you have Hialeah, right? <laughs> not yeah. forget about Hialeah, let's bring them in the house. And so how does, the, how does the data, how the information, how does the, the policy impact our daily lives, right? And, and so for me, I, I didn't necessarily feel very brave. I just I was just transferring information from one place to another um, and then giving us the, the space and the perspective to look at it from this other lens. Um, and, and I think that's something that I am able to do with my work is to, to bring it about and create that kind of distance where you have the option to look at it and engage with it or walk away and not and allow, and, and as Danielle had mentioned, allow to give people that opportunity to, to do or not to do. There we go. We have we have Hialeah. It's in the house. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for allowing such a space to occur. You know, for for the the past two months. I know it just well for this show, but right. always in your practice. And um, with that, I think that would be our last question for tonight. But I do invite everyone to like give a quick wave or a quick hello uh, or goodbye <laughs> to Juana and thank her for joining us tonight. It was such a wonderful experience. I can't thank you enough. <laughs> so, for I want to thank you for inviting me and my dick for putting it together and Beautiful. holding us in line and for Colette that's providing also the space for us to be able to come together as a community. I think this is the most important thing that as long as we can come together as a community and engage with one another, there's, there's hope for transforming the world. So wonderful. Thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Unbelievable. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.